Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to see you in the numbers, and I'm pleased to I'm pleased that uh, Oliver accepted our invitation and he will present about Mexican film with the following speeches. It's yours. Thank you. So, dobry den and welcome everybody to my lecture today about Luther flowering in Nicola speeches uh, and I will show you all the sites that we have seen during a tour in 2015 that started approximately mid of February and ended uh, beginning of March. So all you can see falls into that time frame. And uh, before I start, maybe some words about myself. So I've been working in Ricola already for about 30 years. That's my favorite species that you might know. And uh, I had the chance to see a lot of species already in nature. And today I will give you an impression from Mexico problems. So. So if we talk about Mexican pinguicola, it would be good also to know a little bit about the geography, about the country, because that's impacting a lot also the growing conditions. So Mexico is a quite diverse country in respect to climatic zones, and it's also quite diverse in mountain ranges. So you have several ones throughout the country. So there is the Sierra Madre Occidental, which is the the western uh, mountain range that goes from the north of close to the US uh, as a continuation of the Rocky Mountains and that goes down to, to the isthmus which is there where there's a brick and that's all the part that's on this side. Um, then you have the other side which is the eastern mountain range uh, also going from north to south with different climatic conditions as you will see soon. And then there is a volcanic belt that is crossing the country a little bit south of Mexico City, uh, where there is also a specific uh, climatic condition, uh, and uh, there are different species that grow on this uh, type of mountain range. And then you have in the very south also a smaller range, uh, which is called Sierra Madre del Sur. You could also see it as an extension of the Western part, but it has a separate name, uh, at least uh, locally. So, and finally, in the center of the country, you have so, so called central highlands. So, this is the higher elevated plateau, so it's not all flat, so it's also there's a lot of smaller mountain range that goes in between, but you have a lot of valleys uh, and surrounding mountains where it starts already at about. 1300, 1500 meters, and the mountain ranges goes then often above 2000 meters, sometimes even higher. So, what is also important to know is about the climatic conditions. I said there are different climatic zones in Mexico, and now I will present you shortly three climatic conditions which are relevant for the species I will show afterwards. So, you have the so-called hot semi-arid climate, um, which uh, is just an example here from the city of uh, General Zaragoza. So it's a, a very dry area, so as it says, it's semi-arid, so it's not always uh, dry. So if you look at the, the temperatures, so in the summertime you have quite hot temperatures, which are in average in the you know, 25 degrees, but over daytime the maximum temperatures are much higher, so it goes uh, above 30 degrees. And in winter time, it's it's going down a little bit, but there's still a quite an important amplitude between night and daytime. During night, temperatures can easily drop in the area of zero or even a little bit below. While over daytime, temperatures easily can get also to 25 degrees. And it's important to know that in total, this is even less than 600 millimeters of rainfall annually. So it's it's really not much rain in this area, and the majority of the rainfall is finally accumulating in the summertime because that's why it's called the rainy season there while in winter time in many months you have less than 10 millimeters so almost no rain at all that you should remember when we talk about those habitats for these species then another one i would like to show you is the subtropical highland oceanic climatic climate 
which is a little bit different. So you see that the total precipitation is, is much higher, so it's more than 1,000 millimeters. And you have a, a bigger difference between the summer rainfall, where it can get over 200 millimeters uh, in, in September, where there's the highest rainfall, but in winter time, it's comparable to the arid side that is around 10 or even less uh, millimeters. So, temperature wise, it's uh, more stable, it's not changing that much. Uh, so, it's always in the range of 10 and 18, 19 degrees. So, a little bit cooler in total because it's also higher up in the mountains. And it's also influenced uh, by the Gulf of Mexico that there's uh, also the, 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 the warm and hot winds getting in but cooling down when it comes to higher altitudes. And then the third one is a humid subtropical climate, which is almost in the coastal area, so it's not, it's still in the mountains, but it's finally uh, already at the edge of it, where you see a huge rainfall, uh, it's 3, 000, almost 3,800 millimeters a year, which is really huge, so it rains more or less every day, because the humid air from the Gulf of Mexico is always coming in and is condensating and then it's raining uh, a lot. So you see a lot of rainfall, you cannot really see a dry season, it's less rain but I will not call it dry because there's still a lot of rainfall. And temperatures are also very stable over the year, there's not, not much variation in it, uh, so it's always in the area of plus minus 20 degrees. So this is a a climate which is only referring to, to one uh, species, which is Pinicula imaginata, that I will show you later. So the rest of the, of the species I will show you belong to the other two climatic zones. So um, let's start with the different species that I show you in the habitat in Mexico. So the first one I would like to talk is Pinicula cassifolia. So there's only a small area where this species is found, which is uh, north uh, east of Mexico City in the state of Hidalgo, in the Chico mountain range. So that's a volcanic mountain range, uh, which uh, goes roughly up to 3,000 meters altitude. And you find Crasifolia uh, only in this high altitude, it's not lower. So it's only known from this high level of, of the mountain range. So that's how it looks like there, almost 3,000 meters. You have these outcrops on the top of, of the rocks, which is volcanic. I don't know exactly which type of volcanic rock it is, um, but uh, that's typical if you are the higher parts that you have everywhere these, these outcrops of these rocks with a vertical wall. And, uh, and that's where the plants are also growing. So you have this vertical rocks and sometimes there's also moss on top of it, sometimes it's even bare rock and the species grows either or in the moss or directly on the rock, so it doesn't matter for the species. And it's definitely not very humid, yeah? so the rainfall is the, the one source of, of, the, of the humidity for the plant, but as it's this high altitude, as I said, there's a lot of con condensation of, of uh, Warmer air, so there is a lot of humidity also caused by the by the humidity of the air that the, the plants will take up. So that's how the the, the winter rosettes look like. So on the sometimes on the bare rock, as you see, so this uh, very thick uh, winter leaves, and out of the winter rosette, there the the flowers are appearing. So the species is only flowering out of the, the winter rosette. So this was for some middle February. Unfortunately, it was still too early to see the whole flowers. That's why we decided to come back at the end of our tour just to see also the species and the flower because it has very nice flowers, as you can see, and uh, it would be a pity to miss them. So typical, so here you see more vertical. You still, still see the summer leaves, uh, the old decayed ones that you can find around the winter rosettes, and here are the first flowerscapes appearing and very typical for this species is this thick white hair so it's uh, not glitterous so it's really just white hairs which color the, the, the flowers scape uh, more or less totally and then 
later on, when they are all expanded, you see uh, almost every plant which is flowering in a more violet, uh, red-violet coloration. That's the typical colors that you can find within the species. And just to give a close-up, so typical for this species, you have this, these yellow spots that you can find almost everywhere on the flower, and you have this kind of yeah, yellowish color that goes on the lower lip, uh, which also has very yellow hair, so that is quite typical for the flower of Uricula crassifolia. And if you have the lateral view, so you see that uh, the tube is quite long, that's why it was placed in to the section long tools. If it's really closely related to Lauriana or Hemiophytica, I have my doubts, but uh, at least that's the character of, of the flower. So you get this hairiness uh, of, this, of the flower skin. So the next species I want to talk, which belongs more or less to the same climatic conditions, is Pinguicula acuminata. So it grows sometimes together with Pinguicula passifolia, but it has also been found recently in other areas, uh, more towards the west of Mexico. And uh, so this species was uh, in the 80s more or less lost, at least it was considered lost, because uh, the herbarium specimen was considered to be macrophylla because the summer leaves look a little bit similar to Acuminata. Um, but finally, I think it was Hans Lewis that rediscovered that species uh, in the mid-80s again, uh, in the El Chico Mountains, where we also have seen before the Crassifolia occurs. So the difference to the species, on first sight it looks very similar, but it is not the bare rock. This is very soft, eroded soil, let's call it soil, uh, so it's covered mostly with moss where it's not eroding again and parts are falling away and the, the, the plants are growing inside the soil. Huh? So at least the, the winter rosettes you will not even see. You, but if you're there, you only can see the flowers that are appearing out of the soil. The rest of the plants are not visible at that time. So that's how it looks if you just take it out. But this is a picture from cultivation, but I just wanted to show you. So this part is then underneath the soil and only the flower appears of the soil in, in the habitat. So that's what you see if you are there. So if you want to find the species outside of flowering in winter, that is a lot of work because you have to look for small holes. And if you're lucky, it was not a hole of an insect, but it's, it's a plant. So you have many attempts that are misleading and you will not find it uh, inside that hole. So, just again, a picture of the flowers. So that's a typical flower of Acuminata. You see this bent uh, tube of the, of the flower, then it's uh, finally getting smaller and then continue in this, uh, in this spur. So coloration is mostly white to white, a little bit violet at the edges. But some years ago, there was a new location identified, uh, had it on a map north of Mexico City, um, which finally have, have wider flowers. So that's in addition to the flower color variation that was initially thought. So you see that the scape is almost glabber, so there are almost no uh, sticky hairs on it. That's the front view. Again, this is a white type more or less uh, has the same size of all lobes. So, and uh, the typical is for the flower, this hairiness around the entrance of the tube and this greenish coloration of the lower uh, part of the lower lobes. So, as I said, the soil is, 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 is kind of a eroded material, so it's very soft. So even when it's dried out, you can dig in easily. Uh, so that's what the plant also needs, uh, because I think it needs a lot of protection, <coughs> otherwise it, it might rot easily. But it's a protection for the plant against yeah, different diseases, also against insects maybe. That might be the reason why it's finally underneath the soil. 
So coming to another uh, species, this is Pinguicula agnata, the distribution that is currently known. It might be go further up because there are also some findings that still have to be confirmed, but goes even to the Sierra de Tamaulipa, so it might the extension of that range might be go even more, more, more north. But these are the specimens that have been identified until now. So, so here you see that the vegetation is completely different. So you have uh, this is a picture in the in the winter time. So you, you have some, a lot of the shrubs and the, and the bushes that are losing their leaves. So there's not a lot of leaves during winter time. But there are there are only few uh, bushes that keep their their leaves, and it's a lot of thorny um, vegetation here, so it's hard to get through. Uh, so here, by the way, this is the, the higher part of the Sierra Gorda, where you also find, for example, the Nucula Calderoni here that comes from this mountain that is extending further north as well, but that's where it comes from. Maragnata is growing more down and in a completely different climatic uh, zone. There. And uh, I said there's a lot of uh, humidity taken up by other sources than rainfall. So what's happening more or less every day in this area, so there's fog coming from the mountains into the valleys where the plants get their, get their humidity from. So even if it's not rainy, it doesn't mean that there's no humidity available for the plants. So that's a location for Pinguicula nata. So if you cultivate some of them, this is the Elobo site, uh, which is uh, a quite easily accessible site because it's just along the road. But nevertheless, it's a very nice one because all these cliffs are covered with thousands and thousands of plants. Here we are on a calcareous rock, so they're growing on calcareous rocks, sometimes in small crevices, sometimes in mosses. Uh, so they take all options uh, where they can grow, and that's why the population is so dense, they're just some impressions. So initially in the description, uh, Pinguicula agnata was considered uh, not forming any winter rosettes, and no winter leaves, but if you see them in winter, you can see that they produce also winter leaves which are non -cumulus. It's not true for all species. If you are in habitat, you see also some plants that still have some, uh, some hairs with glands on it, but in principle most of the, of the plants show uh, winter leaves which are non -cumulus. So Just some impressions from that side. You see everywhere there is a chance for the plant to grow, it grows. Uh, even on the knees, uh, these Hestia plants, also, it's, it's, it's almost anywhere. So this is, as I said, a typical winter rosette with this non coniferous hair on the winter leaves. The rosette is much, much smaller and more compact compared to the summer rosette. And here you see, even if we have February, they start to produce already new leaves, which not extending in size dramatically, but you have the first uh, sticky glands on it again. No idea why this the plant is doing that because it's still getting hotter and less dry until maybe mid of May because that's the peak in temperature and there's almost no precipitation there as well. But for whatever reason, the, the plants do already start at this time of the year producing the first uh, carnivorous leaves. So just some impressions of the flower. So. There are some variation in the flowers uh, in respect to colors. Uh, you have white ones with more violet spots. So typical are these violet spots uh, at the base, at the both sides of the petals, and this tube that is uh, greenish and yellowish. So this is quite typical. But uh, we can have some variation in the color of the petals. Here you have intense violet parts at the outside, <coughs> and those. Uh, and you can have also almost white ones which only have these uh, violet spots at the base. So there's a lot of variation in that population. So just a side view, so there's a very hairy uh, and also with, with 
uh, hairs with glands on the, on the scale. Uh, there is a it's quite a funnel shaped tube which finally continues to, to narrow down and continues in the spur, which is very similar to the one that you have seen for Arcanina, for example. And also typically this, the dense hairs on the upper side of the pedicle. So now coming to a species, Pinguicula takaki, you say, oh, why is that guy showing an annual plant in the middle of the winter? There shouldn't be anything there because it's dry. So what is telling us here? Well, we initially we were thinking the same, but as we were close by, we said, oh, well, we are, we are anyway around, so let's just take a look. Uh, because we have seen already a surprise previously with Pinguicula yasina that was also growing differently as expected, so we said give it a try and let's pass by at the site as well. And when we were there we were very much surprised that the conditions were not as expected. So this is a typical the typical area where Iricula Takaki grows. It's all uh, gypsum hills around. So this is a typical landscape and again this was in the early morning a lot of clouds and fog around. It was not raining because there was no indication of any precipitation, but it was wet there. And that's what you see there. So, Pinguicula takaki, uh, that's how the rosette looks like. And even there, so it's not the start of the flowering because um, it probably starts in late autumn, beginning of the winter. But they still continue to produce not only the flowers but also new plants available from seed. I think that it just continues until the conditions are not favorable anymore and then it just, just stops. Uh, but there's a lot of different generations at the same time that you can see. Uh, so it's a continuous production of plants and flowers. What is also in interesting and it shows that there's still humidity around is the Selaginella plants which are still open. At other sites which are more dry, you see that it's already closed and brown. But here it's an indicator that there must be quite some humidity in the air. Because the soil itself was very dry, but the outside, and you might see that on another picture as well, that there was a lot of humidity condensing on plants there. And that seems to be enough probably for the plants to survive. So you see a lot of flowers produced. Here you see one with a with a seed pod on the top, so it's it's very short lived uh, plant, so within very few weeks it can produce the first seeds already, so that guarantees that it's a continuous reproduction possible until uh, the conditions get less favorable to grow. So, so you see here the humidity, the, the, the water drops on, on everywhere, so not only on the flower, you can find it also around on the plant itself, but so it's really enough for the plant to get it out of the air. So a typical flower, on first side it looks a little bit similar for it to, to the Alatira plant, but here you have this white hairy pad on the middle lobe of the lower lip, and also what is typical, and that might, you might see better in another picture. You have uh, behind this hairy pad, you have a row of yellow hairs that continue in the tube, and there's also a yellow part at the lateral side of the tube, uh, which has also some hairs on it, but mostly they are white. And that you can see also from the outside, the, color, the coloration. So if you see here lateral view, you see here these yellowish marks that uh, I've shown you before from the front. So you can see also from the outside. So this is, this is very typical. Also the venation on it, uh, the funnel-shaped uh, tube. So that's a typical flower of um, as you do not see this species in cultivation, it might tell you that it's not an easy one. <laughs> uh, in principle, animals are not that complicated, but that one, I'm not aware of anybody that has a lot of success on this species because it seems to have special conditions that, is, that are hard to simulate. So I was not successful until now to grow it. So on that side for Takaki, there's not only that species, but I just wanted to show you, it's also Pinguicula gypsicola that grows there as well, but in winter rosette, so already dormant for quite a while. You see still the old long summer leaves, 
but uh, they are all in the tourism at this time of the year and we start growing probably only the yeah, end of May, beginning of June, when the first summer leaves and the flowers appear on that species. So coming to another group of uh, species that grow more in the north, in the real city areas, areas um, the first one I wanted to show you is Pinguit, Pinguicula elersiae. So it's uh, currently, anyway, it's difficult to separate Pinguicula elersiae from Isimilana. The characteristics that are given to me are not always conclusive and do not meet always the situation in reality. So the populations are often more diverse as described in the species descriptions. Therefore, it's not always easy to separate the Elersia populations from the SIR populations. I separated in this talk just uh, and there are some characters that you could consider as separating them, but unfortunately the work isn't that easy. You have sometimes also intermediate populations that show the one or the other character uh, which normally should belong to the other species. Therefore, it's questionable that these two species really are separate. So some people uh, say that they are both the same. So this is a typical area uh, here in the Sierra de Trinidad, which is uh, close to the to the uh, location where the initial plants were found and described from. So a lot of cacti are growing there, column cacti, a lot of yucca palms. So it's a very uh, difficult area to get access to because there's, it's full of uh, sticking thorny vegetation which is not easy to get. And uh, so in principle very dry but there are sometimes some areas like here, um, kind of small valleys where the climatic conditions are changing a little bit. So Suddenly, you will find bromeliads or tenensia in the trees, which already gives you an indication that there must be somehow more humidity, at least in the air. And then uh, also other plants occur that you will not find outside of these uh, small waves. And that's where you can find also pinguicula elersiae. So that is uh, a winter rosette of uh, pinguicula elersiae in the Sierra de Trinidad, where we have found in that small valley. So just uh, this non carnivorous numerous leaves uh, for the winter rosette, which is typical, and the plants are flowering then only out of the winter. So that's a view of the population. So I think here it looks a little bit too blue. In reality, it's a little bit more violet coloration of the leaves. So this is another one which is in the uh, area close, what I've shown before, <coughs> Pinguicula gypsicola is growing, just one valley on the other side. So typical in the description for, for that species is that the lower and the upper lip are more, have more or less 108% uh, uh, degree uh, angle between the two. Uh, that there is no hairiness on the outside of the lobes, and that they are somehow overlapping uh, at least the upper colors. So, looking at the different plants that we found in habitats, it's, for example, that one shows that there is not always this uh, overlapping of the, of the lobes. Also, the form of the lobes can be pretty diverse. It, what is more or less stable is finally this angle between the upper and the lower lip that for most of the, of the population that we have seen was, was, was quite stable that it was reflecting this angle. But what was also said that the differentiation between Eseriana and between uh, Elersia was that Eseriana only has yellow spot like the, the middle lobe of the lower lip, which you can see here on the laser plant is also present. So this is definitely not anything that is differentiating them that can occur also in the laser. So here just a side view, as I said, there are normally no hairs on top of 
uh, of the lobes, and uh, and you have this 180 degree angle between the upper and the lower. So in contrast, now I show you different lo locations of populations in Oeselliana. So that was the area that I've shown you where the majority of the Elersia populations were found until today. And that's the range for the Eseriana that, that is currently known, at least for populations that are today considered to be regular Eseriana. So a little bit more on the eastern side, and it goes down even to the state of uh, Keretao, so really quite south compared to the populations of Eliade further north. And then I will show you some examples. So here we are in the currently northernmost known population here in the uh, state of Tamaulipas. So we have the Sierra Mountains, <coughs> which is the typical area here. It's very dry compared with what we've seen before, but here it's even dry. And uh, that's how the vegetation looks like. And in respect to Elersia, here the plant is growing not in a narrow valley, it's just growing on, on, on rocks, on limestone rocks that are in the area, mostly north, northwest facing, that it has more shades and probably that has also higher humidity. But the substrate itself at this time of the year is bone dry and there's really no humidity at all. Although it looks pretty green. where you can find uh, the population here growing really in the cracks and sometimes in mosses uh, on, the, on the vertical cliffs. Again, here you have this Selaginella uh, plants, which is an indicator, but you see they are further in development, so they're closing down already, uh, indicating that it's drier compared to the, the other side we've seen before. So here another example where they where they're growing, so they also try to cover everything which is an option to where a plant could grow, so really in small crevices wherever they can. So here just a typical flower from that area. Um, in the original description it was said that for Pinguicula Sariana the angle is, is much smaller. Uh, don't remember exactly the angle but it's, it's less, much less than 180 degrees, but in reality, for this population as an example, it is a little less in angle, but it's also quite flat. Here's some other plants. What you can find more or less always is this yellow spot, but as you have seen before, this is also occurring in Pinocchio <coughs> so this is not different characters. And here already you can see that there is more hairiness around the entrance of the throat and you might see in other pictures that this hairiness goes even a little bit further. Also here, I mean, petals are overlapping so this is nothing special for, for any SDR, for Elasia, so this is also occurring in others. But what is also visible here already, there is a palette on the lower, on the middle lobe of the lower lip. And you can see that in more detail afterwards on, on another picture. So this is a character that, that is quite constant everywhere, that there is a palette formed in, S, in SAR. So here you might see a little bit better, so also the hairiness, and this, this is really a tiny palette I would call, but there's also, it's also covered by hair, and you see in at the entrance of the tube, there is the much, much, much more hairs occurring. So, this is another population that we discovered in the El Cielo mountain range. Uh, one or the other that passed by today, I had uh, some plants with me today, so that's how the flower is looking like. So, almost white, and it has only some. <coughs> Some violet trays around. Interestingly, this population initially was described being Pinguicula crassis. So we were expecting to see Pinguicula crassis out there, but if you see it in reality, it, 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 on first sight it might 
remember a little bit to Kroatien is what you feel closer, it's definitely not a Kroatien, and uh, it's clearly a few people are SLR. Uh, and then another one, because I wanted to show you a little bit more detail about this palette. So this is the southernmost, I said that it goes down to Kereta our state, so this is the southernmost known site here, and we see here this, this palette, more bigger part here, so, so it really this is visible that it's outside of the, of the lobe and it's covered with hairs, and that, that is really something which is, for the population we have seen until now, quite characteristic. Only for us. So now another species that also likes very dry conditions is Pinguicula immaculata. It's only known for from a very small area here in in the mountain range. That's funny. So here you will find the city of Monterey. You have a the lateral uh, range here, and then it turns down to the Sierra Mate um, Oriental. And uh, there's only one small area where, until now, Pinguicula Immaculata was discovered. And uh, you see the white stuff everywhere, so it can be limestone, it can also be gypsum, so this is very variation everywhere, you know, it could be one or the other. That's why it's that the white. And what is typical habitat for Pinguicula immaculata is you have to find areas which have vertical sites, but which are finally kind of narrow channels where normally the water is running through in the rainy season. So this is all washed out, but here in these areas it was much more humid compared to the rest. Wherever it was exposed to more direct sunlight, there was no immaculate form. Only at this small channel, so, so it's not really reflecting exactly because there's it's going up on this side, so it's really a channel like type where you can find a pinguicula immaculata sitting into the, in the substrate. It's also very uh, yeah, porous substrate, uh, you can easily uh, take it away, so it's not really bare rock where it grow. That's a typical winter rosette of Pinguicula immaculata, so it's very hairy, it's quite compact and it's partly in the soil, so the leaves are more standing upwards. You will see the difference afterwards when I show you uh, the other species from the valves. So, so very, very hairy, very compact, and out of this winter rosette, uh, there are the flowers occurring. So this is very, very nice species, which has very nice shape of, of the flower. So you see this very small upper lip, so two lobes around the, the entrance of the tube, and a much, much bigger lower lip with this maximum size for the, for the middle lower lip, which is normally also imaginated here. Here's some, some close up of the flower. So it's really pure white, white, and it's typical also this greenish, yellowish entrance into the very short tube, as you can maybe see on the next picture. So here, a big difference in size of the lower, of the upper lobes and the, and the lower ones. There's quite some variation in the middle lobe, you can see at the habitat, but that is the only variation that. But I have noticed that not much more that different shades, different depths. And so we have a very, very short tube. I wonder if you can call it tube, but so it's very short before or it dispersed. So very typical for, for that flower. And now in comparison, Pinguicula ninalis, which grows more or less in, in, in the same area, a little bit further south, where it was discovered. So I heard from some Mexican scientists recently that they have discovered a site where both species should grow together. So something to be verified maybe in the future, but we have only seen either the one species or the other species that have a specific location. But I've never seen both at the same site. So 
This is a typical area for the Greek Lanzaris. Again, these gypsum hills. So they're only growing on gypsum hills, so not either or on limestone or gypsum. It's only found until today on gypsum. And these gypsum hills are really easy to find because with this white color, so first you have the impression that it must be snow white, but it's just the gypsum that you see here. And so that is the site which is known. It also was the base for the description of the species. Uh, so it's the north facing side of, of, the, of the gypsum hill. First a little bit uh, trees, but then it's just uh, some xerophytic vegetation, so typical here. So this is, this is gypsum. Sometimes it can be crystalline, so very, very hard and sharp, by the way, so you have to be very careful. Uh, but there, were, there are also eroded parts where the Pinguica and Mars finally are growing. So they're not growing on the crystalline one, but they're growing on some eroded material. So the winter rosettes of Pinguicula nivalis are less hairy compared to the Uniculata, what you have seen, and the rosette is also more flat on the ground. So it's not a little bit bulk like, so it's really flat. The color yeah, also can differentiate a little bit more red, reddish brown, but I would not say that this is a differentiating factor. But already the winter rosette, you see that it's, it looks similar. If you see the summer rosettes, so some people that have grown these two species already, so the, the summer leaves of the Immaculata are very narrow, and so compared to Nivalis, which is more rounded, so you can see quite some obvious differences between the two. And uh, it's sometimes even hard to separate the flower from the gypsum because it looks so white. But if you go closer, then you will find also the flowers there. Um, a little bit similar to Immaculata. Um, it's also this different size of lower and upper lip, but you see that the upper lobes are much bigger compared to Immaculata. And also the difference between the the lower lobes of the lower uh, lip is, is a little bit less. You know. They are overlapping mostly, but it's not a, a big, big difference between the two flowers, maybe. That's why some people think that uh, it might not be a distinct species. So here you see again this overlapping petals of the lower lip and the bigger lobes of the apple. And the rest of the flower looks pretty similar as the Immaculata. You see the very short tube and then the, the spur which looks also similar. So the flower scape as you can see is, is glabber so there are no glands on it. Okay, coming to another species, uh, which is uh, the question if I should show this as winter flowering, but uh, as we were there in winter and it was flowering, I consider it at least flowering in the winter, maybe it's not the, the main flowering time, but at least it's also flowering in the winter. So Pinguicula imaginata, and I've shown you before this climate graph with this high uh, precipitation, almost 3,000 millimeters, with the higher temperatures, so really subtropical area here, and also the vegetation therefore looks very, very different compared to what you've seen before. So it's really a forest, often it's cloud forest, there's a lot of clouds in, there's a lot of rain, so everything is green, green, green. And the typical location for Pinguicula imaginata is always along on streams, on wet cliffs of streams, or as here along of waterfalls. So this is one site uh, which is called Cascada Las Pisas, at about 900 meter elevation. So it's very warm, very humid, and that's sandstone, so different uh, stone compared to what we've seen before. And it's covered densely with moss and also with algae you will see soon. Very nice place, very touristic, so that nobody is really caring about the plants. <laughs> And that's how it looks like. So the wall, dripping wall, full of plants. Wherever you look, you see plants, 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 and flower. And it was, uh, I think, 
beginning of March when we were there, and uh, it was just the start of the flowering season. So in cultivation, often this species is flowering more or less all year round, but uh, in habitat, it's a little bit different. So this was just the start of the flowering, and we have seen another population of Pinocula imaginata some years before in uh, <coughs> September, and there was no flowers at all. As you see, that's probably starting in winter, going into spring, and maybe beginning of summer, but then it stops, so it's not flowering habitat all year round. At least that's what we have found. Yeah, so the typical rosette. So it was reported that Pinguicula imaginata can also make winter rosettes, but to be honest, I haven't seen any until now. So also here we haven't seen any winter rosettes. So I don't know if it's true that it really can form or it was just uh, misbuilt plant that was considered as winter rosette, but I cannot confirm that from habitat that it's really good. So flower coloration, so it's a typical imaginative leaves uh, of the flowers, this venation that can be more or less intensive. So the range of the flowers is ranging from almost white until this uh, more violet coloration, so there's everything in between also in the intensity of venation. So let's just go through the flowers, it's just nice to see. So this is more whitish one with only some violet veins on them. So very nice place to go. So finally, um, we come to Pinguicula laxifolia. So that was one of our major attempts just to find this plant and flower because it was described only for herbal material and there were only people before that have seen it in summer research, so it was to us really interesting just to see this plant also in flower. Uh, unfortunately, that state is not considered the safest in Mexico, so it was quite important to have a good arrangement uh, that uh, your trip is safe and that you finally get somebody that takes you there, that, which uh, hopefully does not only take your money, <laughs> but leave you there because you need a guide to get into this area, so it's a protected area, um, biosphere reserve. And you're only allowed to get there with, with some guides, and uh, otherwise, to be honest, you would not even find the plant because we are not along the nature. Actually. So, <coughs> the El Cielo Biosphere Reserve is quite interesting also for other reasons than just for, for Pinguicula because it's very diverse. It's ranging from tropical species at the lower level, then going to more drier part. Uh, on the top, and then the, the western side uh, of the mountains are getting semi desert. So it's a very interesting area for all types of different, different plants if you look, and also uh, edibles, by the way. So that's more or less how it looks like on the top. So there's the, the cloud. When you pass the clouds, you see all the vegetation is getting much, much dry because there's not much rainfall anymore. So you're coming out of a more or less tropical forest into a more drier mountain. Uh, Forest and that's uh, the habitat where you can find Pinguicula laxifolia. So you have this outcrops of vertical limestone uh, cliffs that are quite numerous, but they are not uh, that often. So you have to look for this type of, of habitat. And then, if you're lucky, you can find Pinguicula laxifolia growing on these vertical limestone cliffs, and that's the, the starting of the season, the flowering season, so it starts at mid of uh, February and probably goes into April, so we were lucky that, we, that it has started, so initially it was reported to start already a little bit earlier, so that's why we have seen a lot of plants that have not yet opened flowers, but we still have found enough to see how the flower looked like. So it's really growing on almost bare rock in some crevices, almost no soil in between. And uh, so that's the winter rosette, but you already see the, the long, long summer leaves, which are just dried um, and they, they're just visible, but that's the winter rosette. And that's how the flower looks like. Well, unfortunately, on the picture is a little bit too violet, so it has a little bit more pinkish coloration, uh, very, Big uh, entrance of the of the tube. Here, come a little close up. 
So what is very typical beside this open throat is this very yellow uh, coloration with the yellow hairs on it. Um, and then another example, so there is quite some variation also in the shape of the, of the lobes. Can be longer, can be more or less uh, close to the same size, so there's a whole type of variation in it. And what is also very typical is the very broad funnel shaped tube that you can hear with a bright long spur that is extending, uh, extending the tube. And the scape is, is, as you can see, is very hairy. Some with glands on it, some not. So, a very typical flower of Pinguicula laxifolia. So, I have shown you before a um, Pinguicula SLR population that was growing in the same mountain range, and sometimes they grow more or less close together and they'll be found there. It was a hybrid between the two. It was just starting to open, but already the rosette was indicating it must be something different. And as only these two species were occurring there, we were pretty sure that it was a hybrid between Laxifolia and Sariana. So I have to show you a flower from cultivation because there was no open flower there. And finally, when, we, when the flower was opening, then I think it was confirmed that it must be something, a hybrid between the two species because it was showing characters of, of both of them. So quite nice one. Also the rosettes, the summer rosettes are very nice, having some red venation on it. So it's interesting hybrid. Also, the cultivation you see the scape and the spur is densely covered with glands, so something which comes more from the SRR to the hairy one from Laxifolia that you have seen. And I think that was it. So, I hope you enjoyed the small tour to Mexico, and I have to thank you for your attention. Sure. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Okay. Yeah. You have shown us a lot of beautiful photos of no less beautiful plants. I would like to ask you as a plant physiologist, what is the pH of the substrate they need to, or they need or demand these these four pinguicula species? Do they, do they uh, require at least neutral pH and higher, or are there also some acid loving species among them? So, we have not tested any pH in the field, to be honest, um, but there are some types of soil which indicate that it's more neutral. I would not say that there is too much alkaline soil because the on the limestone doesn't mean that it's necessarily alkaline, and often it's growing in mosses, which is more uh, getting neutral to acid, but I would say it's more in the neutral area. Uh, but I have cannot give you really confirmation from field, I only can give you confirmation from my growing uh, experience where all are growing in neutral conditions, so around pH 7, and uh, I have not the impression that a lot of species have not liked it, but maybe they are more variable in it, but I cannot give you really some, some information of the pH and those things But I would say most of them, gypsum for example is a more neutral one, so they shouldn't be. So I would think that's the preferred pH, probably. but they can probably grow on other more acid and more alkaline well. Thank you. Questions I would ask myself. Uh, this seen from the pictures, there are a lot of mists. Uh, do you think it's recommend recommendable to mist the plants during the dormancy in cultivation or is it too risky? I think that is very much depending on the rest of your condition your ground is growing, especially what is the humidity in your area. If you grow in a greenhouse, especially during the winter time, you have probably higher humidity, at least that's my experience with my greenhouse. And uh, then the temperatures are cooler. So misting them has some risks, but it's 
depending if you keep your plants really low and dry. I've shown you the precipitation is really low, low, low. So most is coming from the air. But I think the important is that you have a combination with a good aeration. So if you missed it, but you have also a ventilator that is circulating the air, I think it's less risky if you spray it without a lot of aeration in, in, your, in your greenhouse or wherever you grow it. I think then the risk is much higher that there is some water in the soil that might cause any, any rot. Mm -hmm. Okay. My experience is that aeration is really key. So when you have a lot of ventilation in the area, that is reducing the risk of, of rotting from that. Okay. Yes, ask a little bit. About the sunlight, do they grow in the nature in full sunlight? More shady, I think. So most of growing in, on, on cliffs orientation is more north, northwest, but it doesn't mean that there's no sun coming here yeah, in the they are not growing, let's say, in most places during full sunlight at noon, but in, in the morning or in the evening, you have quite seen a lot of spaces where there was direct sunlight. But not really at, at, at noon or around that time where the start is still. So there it's at the same time any plants that are growing on those. Often there's also surrounding vegetation that also makes it additional shade. Mm -hmm. And shrubs often plants are growing up by shrubs, and so that it gives additional um, protection, even if the orientation of the hill itself might be a little bit more towards south. But um, it's, it's, it has a big impact with the vegetation around. Mm -hmm. There was another yeah. question. Uh, a lot of species have these uh, winter rosette and summer rosette, but in my collection, they just do whatever they want. and. Is there some way to manage to get them all in one line? Or you don't have a problem? <laughs> well, normally if you reduce the watering and keep them really dry, that is some kind of induction for the plant that the dry season is beginning. So at least in my experience that if I keep them really dry, and I mean really dry, so I do not water them uh, for two or three months, um, that often forces the plant or gives some impulse to the plant to produce winter leaves because they do not expect some water. You do that in summer or winter? Well, I, will, I start normally end of November uh, where I stop watering completely and we start something around the beginning of March a little bit and then increase the watering uh, towards May where then I keep them more moist. Uh -huh. And that normally also was finally driving this production of the winter leaves. Sometimes it's genetic because you see, um, you have seen, for example, some cyclosecta population at this time of the year where they normally are not producing summer leaves again, but just a higher humidity. No idea where it was coming from, but it was visible that it must be higher humidity as normal. Plants were starting already producing summer leaves again even if the time was not the right one. But I would think that this humidity somehow is driving also the reaction of the plant. But if you keep them wet, it can be that they have some other sense all year round. Thank you. Maybe I'll add a question about the dormancy uh, to this one. Uh, because I have read that uh, apart from the uh, dryness, uh, the cold temperature is also, uh, let's say, informational for the plant that the winter is coming, that the dry winter is coming, that it will be cold and dry. Do you think that the temperature is important as well? So even in winter it can be quite hot, but just up during daytime, but the amplitude is much more higher during night. So it goes, as I said before, sometimes it can go close to freezing point or even below in some places. So I think it's more than night temperatures. It also could be due some reaction to produce the winter things that could be. But I've seen it also under warm conditions that just reduce the water. Because so for a long time I kept my plants in my basement where 
the night temperatures were not dropping mm -hmm. significantly, uh, some of the same reaction after the past, that when they had more water, that they started to produce the winter. So, the reinforcement. There was a reinforcement in the winter. Yeah, there was a reinforcement in the winter. That's my experience that the water is too busy to run. Thank you. Okay. No other questions? Thank you very much.